Well, gang, it's a new year, and after all the polls regarding this year's big game review, it seems this is what you asked for. For starting now, we'll be reviewing the hit game from 2016 and 2017, Persona 5. Oh, what a game to talk about. After the large success of Persona 4, to the point where Atlas wouldn't stop making spin-off games for it, fans were finally treated with news that a sixth game in the series would be made, with imagery that hints of the game's theme involving emancipation from a corruption of society, one that is out to keep people down and explore the different ways society does such a thing. It's about the outcasts fighting to break the chains that bind them and give those the courage to do the same. There's a lot to bring up regarding Atlas and how they treat their themes, but I digress. Development started as far back as 2011, and along with returning series character designer and music composer, Shigenori Sojima and Shoji Meguro respectively, it was expected the game would come on the PS3. Which it did! In 2016. But that's also because of the delay made to have it also release on the PS4. Really, with how the game was marketed and what bonus content they did for it in other media, this was a highly anticipated game and people were just excited on the visuals and presentation alone. It was unlike any other Persona game yet, so hopefully they put the same effort in the story, right? Well, that depends on what you're expecting. Personally, after playing it myself, I really like the game and find it good. Just not Persona 4 good. And I know people who aren't into the games and find them bad for various reasons, and that's fine. I don't expect to change their minds, but at least I want to get across why I find this title, and others like it, to be... good. While also looking into the various flaws and criticisms that people have on them. Naturally, most of the footage is mine, unless I need to credit others for stuff I miss, or because I'm unable to sync some of the footage that got messed up during recording. Also, I am going to be using a guide for various stuff, but you're free to try the game without it, and the rest you can decipher. With that said, let us begin this four-part review of one of the biggest games ever released. This is Persona 5. So the game begins proper at the Casino Night Zone, where an incident is occurring that's causing quite a stir. And the cause? You. It's apparently a diversion, as we hear the voices of our friends cheering you on to escape while security is hounding you, which serves as a quick demonstration of the sort of gameplay that's to come, all while awesome music plays. It's not a cave, I'm not a robot. of time to bring up the music, as well as the gameplay in general, but otherwise, the next cutscene shows us escaping in rather dramatic fashion. Seems we got away. Or not. As we get knocked down, it seems that one of our teammates sold us out. But who could have done it? In any case, our hero now gets to experience the horrors of police brutality and corruption. From being drugged, to being beaten up, to learning that they can alter surveillance footage so they can get away with stuff in court. Truly a topical and political game. Seriously, if you think that just because this is Japan that it wouldn't have politics, you're sorely mistaken. The drugs must really be getting to you since you struggle to remember your own name. I go with his anime name, Ren. We also get to set the difficulty, which for this playthrough it'll be on normal. Now, because of some of the various crimes we appeared to have committed, we're going to be interrogated by Prosecutor Sai Nijima. She's been on this case for some time now, and despite what they're saying to her, she's able to see you. 
Despite your condition, she is hoping to know everything about how you did all the things you did prior to this point, but not before we the player get some subtext to what we're to expect based on what this voice is telling him. You are held captive, a prisoner of fate to a future that has been sealed in advance. This is truly an unjust game. Your chances of winning are almost none. But if my voice is reaching you, there may yet be a possibility open to you. I beg you, please overcome this game and save the world. The key to victory lies within the memories of your bonds, the truth that you and your friends grasped. It all began that day, when the game was started half a year ago. Now for the record, most of this game is being played out like it's a recollection of sorts. We're playing up to the moment that we are captured, and everything that happens can be what he is able to remember. How this ties to getting a game over will also be brought up later as well. Now we flash back to April 9th, when Ren first arrives in Tokyo, where he thinks back to an incident involving a woman and some bald guy. Not just that, but as we cross through Shibuya, we notice a freaky yap on the phone, and... Yeah, I'm just gonna delete that. Now that we're out of that, we can properly go over the game's controls. You're mostly moving with the left stick and interacting with people or objects with X. It's pretty much no different from Persona 3 or 4 as far as the social aspect is concerned, just that the character models are a lot nicer and more detailed than they were in those games. While the game's design is similar to Catherine, which Atlas also produced for the PS3, the game uses its own in-house custom engine, versus Catherine's use of the Gamebryo engine. Civilian NPCs with no real significance can have faceless designs to depict them as part of the general civilian masses that you won't really know personally, while those who have significance stand out by having actual designs. You even see it during transition scenes, be it the subway train or the loading screens. So you look around this neighborhood, trying to find Sojiro Sakura, the man who runs a cafe that you'll be staying with. Because your parents were friends of one of his customers, and he ended up accepting their request to take care of you. Since, as it turns out, despite them knowing you protected this woman from some asshole who decided to sue you, you got expelled from your old high school, and the court forced you to transfer to a new one, while your parents agreed to have you stay here. It's like for bothering to stand up to oppression, you get punished and branded a criminal by even your own family. What the hell? Thus you have to spend the year in Shujin Academy. Like every game, it seems you're a transfer student. You can make whatever choice you like in being obedient or rebellious all you want, it won't matter. Oh hey, the app is back. Time to delete it again. And then, Velvet Room time. Trickster, welcome to my Velvet Room. So, considering the games I played, while 3 had the room based on the main character and his ascension up a large dark tower in an elevator that's never-ending, and 4 was in a limousine that reflected the main character's case involving the foggy TV world and an unknown truth, here, it's a reflection of how the main character is imprisoned by the rules of society and the inescapable fate that it has in store. So in regards to Igor's voice actor, he is currently being voiced by David Lodge, despite Dan Warren normally doing it from Persona 3 to Persona 4 Arena. I know the reason that I can't say for plot reasons, but for now, let's just say it has to do with a change with his original voice actor, Izumu Tanunaka, who passed away in 2010 and has had his work archived for games that Igor would appear in. But since this is a new game and all, it makes sense they need to get someone new like Masane Tsukuyama. In any regard, Igor is telling us we're a prisoner of fate and the world is on the path of ruin. 
The only way to stop the world's ruin is to be rehabilitated to freedom by challenging this world's distortions. It'll make more sense as we go along, since these games like to start out vague but lead to some ultimate meaning through supernatural activity. For residents, we have the twins Justine and Caroline, who I'll get into their functions later. The next morning, we get taken to school and get our first look at some of the school faculty, like our homeroom teacher, Miss Kawakami, who is not looking forward to you attending, and Kamashita, who seems like a chill guy, I mean, sure, it sounds like if you mess up once, you're going back to juvie. Also, it seems the accidents from yesterday are furthering here, as apparently a subway car derailed. We even get to see it. <laughs> that didn't look good. This also gets the attention of Sai and her unnamed director, who seems to suspect everything relating to each other somehow. She also plans to bring this up with some student, who you may recognize from the artwork and from his voice at the start of the game. Meaning, he's a main character. Can we discuss this over sushi, perhaps? You are making a student work late, after all. Conveyor belt only. Aww. So after learning how to save your game, which you can do anywhere in the normal world, and learning that the app will not leave your phone no matter how many times you delete it, you make your way to school the next day. Since we've yet to learn how to quick travel, of course the game has you walk through the maps just to give the immersion of walking through the various cities of Japan, till you travel near the academy and into another animated cutscene. We've been getting a lot of these lately. We see another one of our main characters, on Takamaki, voiced by Erika Harlarcher, getting into a car with... Kamashita? Morning. You want me to give you a ride to school? You are going to be late. Um, sure, thank you. Oh. Oh no. Seems this student's got beef with him. Meet Ryuji Sakamoto, voiced by Max Middleman, whose frustration gets you to say... Perfect teacher. He doesn't realize you're a transfer student till after a little bit, at which point he mentions how Kamashita acts like he's... well, king of a castle. Well, pervy tactics aside, nothing seems to really scream evil king. But anyway, as you go to leave... Yeah, the game will occasionally jump back to the future just so Nijima can question about our actions at that point in time while also providing some light foreshadowing on what's to come. It's... Eh. I get that it's still a literary device at this point, but with how frequent they happen, it kind of breaks the pace of the story just for us to jump back and forth between an occurring event to tell me more about this person. Like, we can probably figure out who we're going to go after, or who we'll meet, and what they're like. You don't need to be that blatant about it. Back to the past, the app does something as we walk down the alleyway to the school. Only something odd happens, and we end up... in front of a castle? There was supposed to be a school here, right? Naturally, we're confused, especially when we get approached by this weird night guy, who, along with reinforcements, end up capturing and imprisoning us. And with no way out, we have to deal with the guys who want to kill us for unlawful entry. Just a bit of an overreaction. But then we meet the owner of this castle. No one's allowed to do as they please in my castle. Huh? Wait, is that you, Kamoshida? I thought it was some petty thief. But to think it'd be you, Sakamoto. Ah, yes. We're back to using Shadow Selves. Just like with Persona 2 and up. Only it's kind of like Persona 4, where they also have their own dungeons. And if anything, this is meant to imply that Kamashita is like this. Or this is how he sees himself. Some self-absorbed king willing to wear tights and pushes around like peasants. Only he is fine with killing people which leads to Ryuji telling us to run like he's protecting us, despite denying being friends. 
Point is, it's awakening time since you don't want either of you to die. Are you forsaking him to save yourself? Death awaits him if you do nothing. Was your previous decision a mistake then? Very well. I have heeded your resolve. I am thou. Thou art I. Thou who art willing to perform all sacrilegious acts for thine own justice. Call upon my name and release thy rage. Show the strength of thy will to ascertain all on thy own. Though thou be chained to hell itself. Huh? Bad, though compared to the in-game cutscenes, not as dramatic looking as they should be. So this is Arson, Rin's starter persona, who certainly acts and sounds like a complete badass, which is why you will only use him for a short time before replacing him completely until you need him for fusion bait. This section can serve as dungeon and battle tutorial, but I'll provide a better explanation later when we have more characters. For now, we take the key and lock up Kamashita and try to get out of here. Along the way, we notice students locked in cages. Just what is going on? And then, as we get stuck at a bridge that's pulled up, we meet... A talking cat! What is this thing? You're not soldiers of this castle, right? Get me out of here! Look, the key's right there! Well, this already has a better talking cat plot than that one movie. This is Morgana, voiced by Cassandra Morris, and he claims he knows a way to get out of here. So, we reluctantly take him along, and he shows us how to open the drawbridge. Then we get into another fight, in which Morgana shows off his persona, Zorro. It also teaches us another mechanic to this game, before leading us to what appears to be an exit to the outside. He bids farewell as he has some other business in here, and suddenly we're back outside to the real world. What, is this a travel app? Of course, during all of Ryuji's rambling about the freaky crap going on, and if it was even real or not, we get the police on us, who thankfully just tell us to go to school or we get in trouble. Ryuji's still mad, but at least he's cooperating with us. Sadly, they told the school about this, so we get approached by the counselor and Kamashita. The latter, seemingly oblivious to what happened. Still, it sounds as though the teachers respect Kamashita enough that any dissent on him is met with criticism. And Kamashita might seem chill enough to not yell. He does seem to act like, I'll overlook it this time, but next time you won't be so lucky. All for being late to school. Speaking of school, before and after getting to class, you can tell the students of this school really view you as a dangerous delinquent. And worse, when you pass by on to get to your seat, they treat the way you look to her as like, Oh my god, are they going out together? That's like cheating on Kamashita. Like the students are that gossipy and will use it to make you look bad, no matter what. Like one misdeed will blanket everyone's viewpoint on someone, which is a bit of a harsh reality we face since people can react in a way that they reach certain conclusions despite the truth. So Ryuji has his doubts about what happened earlier, and also brings up how Kamashita was once a medalist, so no one says anything bad about him. Still, we have ourselves a new friend, and hopefully he'll be a much more enjoyable dumbass than the one bigoted dumbass. That night, we end up back in the Velvet Room, where Igor tells us about what Personas are. Personas are, in other words, a mask. An armor of the heart when confronting worldly matters. And depending on the game, it's either spawned by holding out a tarot card, or shooting yourself in the head. 
I don't know what the first three games methods are, I only know this line of games. Now something that these games also do is slowly integrate you into the common systems the game has. In this case, the pop quizzes. Answer the question correctly and you get a point toward knowledge. It's one of five social stats, including guts, charm, kindness, and proficiency. All of whom are required for different events and later there's even a point where first timers see what happens when your proficiency is low. Of course, later on, the game takes advantage of the system's network feature that lets you see the common choices everyone in the world has, be it for quizzes or what they choose to do for their day. But for now, we're stuck in story mode, and Ryuji wants to try going back to the castle because it's been bugging him. You try going back the way you went to get there, but nothing happens. That's when you remember. Oh yeah, that app acted up when we first met Ryuji and he sees it as some sort of navigational app, the Metaverse Navigator. We go through the search history and it works. So now we're back in that other world. Morgana comes back, wondering why we're here, and he explains what this place is. This castle is the school, but only to this castle's ruler. I think you called him Kamoshida? It's how his distorted heart views the school. Kamoshida? Distorted? Explain it in a way that makes sense! So, let me try putting it to words. It's kind of like the TV world of Persona 4, where this other world creates these dungeon areas based on a person's desires, in which case, distorted desires from their heart. This metaverse, as it's called, is meant to be based on people's cognitions, in which case, Shujin Academy to Kamashida is his castle, and he's the perverted king who gets off on high school girls. The size of the palaces, as the dungeons are called, can vary depending on how large the distortion is. Of course, some parts can have less distortions and can act as safe rooms to let you save and change up your party. It's hard to summarize, but pretty much you can think of this as a parallel world that the shadow selves occupy and those with strong distortions in their hearts get to have fancy dungeons for you to run around in. As for your outfit, it represents your rebellious spirit that protects you from the distortions. Speaking of dungeons though, we can get the basic combat stuff out of the way now. Typically, what you want to do, which is not what I did at the start, is sneak up on an enemy and ambush them. Doing this gives you the initiative and lets you get your attacks in before the typical turn order is made. You can also change up your tactics so that your party acts according to what roles you set, like in the previous two games, or you can take full control of them, so you don't have to leave things up to chance. As for actually fighting, you have your standard basic attack and the ability to use a Persona skill, which either uses HP or SP, depending on the kind of ability it is. But later, you get yourself a gun, a model gun, but here in the metaverse, your cognition believes it to be a real gun, and sure enough, it fires real bullets. Morgana just uses a slingshot, because cats can't hold guns, apparently. Either way, you can only fire off as many rounds per turn, and the total amount of bullets don't refill until you leave the palace and come back. The common goal of each fight is to try and exploit the enemy's weakness, so you can knock them all down and perform the iconic all-out attack, which requires you and at least one other person to perform which does a lot more damage than normal. Of course, you need to pay mind to the enemy's affinity chart, since they can be strong against your attacks or even do other things like repel or nullify those elements. Your personas also have their own chart that works the same way, so it's a matter of figuring out what works best in each situation. Also, besides the fact that you're at the mercy of how much HP and SP you'll have while progressing, there's also the security level to worry about. If you get spotted by an enemy and they chase you, the meter will go up a bit. The higher it goes, the higher the chance enemies will respawn after a battle, and if you happen to let it reach 100%, you get kicked out of the dungeon. There's more to come, of course, so for now, we find where the screams of the slaves are coming from. And we learn firsthand that the non-shadow people are simply cognitions of the people Kamashita sees them as. So this is how he views the sort of training methods he gives to the students. 
In short, he's abusive, and the students have no choice but to endure, unless they want to get executed. You could say it's part of the cruel conformity that society has on them. You either do what the teacher says, or face ridicule. Or worse. Since our cameras don't work here, Ryuji settles on memorizing their faces and talking with their real selves later. For now, time to leave! Of course, Shadow Kamashita finds us and isn't at all intimidated by our threats to expose him. In fact, he even brings up some... interesting details about Ryuji's past. I speak of the track trainer who acted in violence, ending his teammates' dreams. Oh, I can only imagine the pain of the others who were dragged under with your selfish act. He betrayed his teammates and crushed their hopes. Yet he still carries on as carefree as ever. It was nothing but an eyesore. The only one who needs to achieve results is me. That coach who got fired was hopeless too. Had he not opposed me with a sound argument, I would have settled it with only breaking his star's leg. What? Do you need me to deal with your other leg too? <laughs> the school will call it self-defense anyway. This game does a lot to make Kamashita to be the biggest bad guy imaginable, and given this game's premise, they have to do everything they can to get you to care for these kids. Especially since Ryuji is powerless to help you against the shadows, and almost gives in to the spare thrown on him. But with some encouragement from you, he gets his resolve to stand up against his corrupt teacher, and goes through his own awakening. You made me wait quite a while. You seek power, correct? Then let us form an act. Since your name has been disgraced already, why not hoist the flag and wreak havoc? I am thou, thou and I. There is no turning back. The skull of rebellion is your flag henceforth! <laughs> Now, why couldn't Ren's awakening be as painful and well-made as that? So now, Ryuji can fight. Using the power of Captain Kid, he's able to use a mix of physical attacks and lightning spells. He uses bludgeons as his melee weapon, and for his ranged weapon... I got a shotgun! <laughs> of course, it's soon time to leave due to exhaustion, but before we do, we get to see Kamashita's cognition of On wearing her kitty panties. Dude! What a meowless and beautiful girl! Not now, Morgana! Anyway, we get out, and apparently Ryuji didn't realize he has a new outfit now. Going to be a thing for the next few people. And don't worry, whatever happens here doesn't make the real Kamashita say anything, as this is separate from his normal self. In any case, since Morgana helped us, he wants us to help him remove the distortions on his body and recover his true form. But of course, Ryuji stiffs him and we just leave. More importantly, we're going to do our part in finding Kamashita's victims and stopping his ring of terror as close friends. Oh right, I forgot. This happens. So what is meant to happen is we get the usual poem that says we awakened to a new bond with someone of a certain arcana. While before these are social links, here they are labeled as confidants, but the function is the same as before. You spend time with the person of interest, and each rank up will have an effect on new personas you create. Also, while party members have benefits for battle, they can do other things for you as well. This also extends to non-party members. However, with the exception of a few individuals, every time you form a new bond, you get sent back to the present day, just so Sai can waste your time commenting on how you were able to do stuff because someone did something for you. And I mean it when I say that it happens. Every. Single. Time. Now, An is of course affected by Kamashita's actions, as she has this friend named Shiho, 
who tends to get abused as well, but Ahn tries to protect her, even if she doesn't know everything he does. The guy plays up this act as this mighty teacher who could be a humble hero to the school, but that's just a facade meant to keep others from questioning him. Naturally, we get started on finding the victims we saw at the castle, and at most, none of them are willing to openly admit to being abused. The only person of interest we get is a kid named Mishima. Phil An tries talking to you about what she heard about you, but this just gets Ryuji to bring up how she's apparently dating Kamashita. I guess seeing her in the other world made him think she's like this when he has no idea what she's been through since middle school. As far as Mishima goes, we try to get a reasonable response out of him and almost get into trouble with Kamashita. But here's the kicker. Mishima admits that it's pointless to say anything because everyone knows that Kamashita is an abuser. The principal, the parents, everyone knows he's a dick and they don't care. They'd rather let their kids suffer as long as it produces results for their school. We're running out of options, but Ren brings up we could punish his shadow self. I finally found you. Don't think you can get away with not paying me back for helping you. That voice. Is that you, Morgana? How dare you up and leaving me the other day? Oh wow, now he really is a talking cat. At least he looks like an anime cat and not like this. Well, he's talking, but only we can hear it. Guess it's part of the side effect to being in the metaverse. In any case, he confirms that we can indeed go after Shadow Kamashita by changing his heart. Since the castle is the source of his distorted heart, causing it to disappear will cause him to change and confess to all his crimes. This is done by stealing the treasure that's hidden within. The only catch in joining him on this is the risk of causing a mental shutdown, which we've already seen examples of. We could very well kill Kamashita if we're not careful, and this is certainly a heavy topic, even for guys who hate Kamashita. We'll at least sleep on it, but first, you happen to overhear An talking with Kamashita about something that she doesn't want to do, but he's sounding like if she doesn't do what he says, she'll kick Shiho off the team or something. This seems like none of our business, but we pursue her anyway because that's something a stranger does to a fellow classmate. She does finally decide to talk to us about her problems, because you appear to be the kind of person who'd listen. I avoided giving him my number for the longest time. He told me to go to his place after this. You know what it means. If I turn him down, he said he'd take my friend off as a regular on the team. I've been telling myself this is all for Shiho's sake. I can't take it anymore. I've had enough of this. I hate him. But still, Shiho's my best friend. She's all I have left in that sorry excuse of a school. Tell me, what should I do? Now, in my opinion, I feel like some of the best development happens right at the start of this game. They needed some kind of reason to get you to care for these characters, or something worth pursuing, and in this case, it's some way to ease everyone's suffering. We've seen how much Kamashita affected these kids, and how much of a monster he is that it reflects onto his shadow self as well. These are things that can be relatable to real life abuse, and how people around you interpret things differently, or straight up ignore you for their own benefits. It's something this game does a lot, and for better or for worse, it's something we really need brought up. How much you wish for them to bring up is up to your expectations, but just the base concept of this game is worth exploring. The tone is just the right balance between 3 and 4's dark and light themes that we can take scenes like this seriously and get the full weight of how much this matters. The abuse and suffering these kids are going through is so bad that it's driving them to suicide. 
Kamashita has lots of blood on his hands, and who knows how long this has been going on for. Of course, after learning from Mishima that Kamashita beats students whenever he gets frustrated, we confront him with Ryuji ready to bust his ass. Kamashita just acts like he knows they're right, but they have no proof. He's just pushing them to act against him, and he knows he can get away with it. He makes me sick to the core, and I just want to... Oh right, thanks Ren. Since Shiho is in a coma, it's not like she can testify to back our claims up. And of course, he's gonna have all three of us expelled. Ryuji for the violent outburst, Mishima for leaking our criminal records online, at Kamashita's behest too. And you, because you were here and have a criminal record. He told me to do it. I had no choice. <laughs> finished here you're all expelled kamashita so yeah screw what happens with him let's go into his world and kick his ass sure there's a chance what morgana said might not happen but who cares on comes by having heard of our eventual expulsion and she seems to want action against kamashita as well but ryuji despite acting like he thinks she's against them knows she can't get involved in the sort of danger they're about to face and gets her to leave doesn't stop her from following us, and the nav app drags her into the metaverse as well. Her reactions are as such. That voice! Sakamoto? And are you... Why are you here? How should I know? What's going on? Hey, where are we? Isn't this the school? We kick her back out before returning, in which Morgana explains about how they should refer to each other by code names, such as you being called Joker, Ryuji deciding on Skull, and Morgana being Mona. But not long after we go in and do more dungeon crawling, On makes it back because she now has the app and remembers the keywords we said out loud. And she gets caught because they think she's their princess. Now comes the part we've all been waiting for. Obtaining Personas. This is part of another process, called the Hold Up, where after downing all the enemies, you can choose to go into an all-out attack by pressing triangle as soon as possible, or you can select an enemy and negotiate with them. You can get money, you can get items, or as this tutorial shows, you can convince them to join your side. The shadows are basically just personas that don't remember their name. And upon getting them, the enemy versions are renamed to what they really are. Of course, from this point on, you need to answer a couple of questions to get them into the mood to join. A good mood, or else they retaliate. That can happen when asking for other things too much, but here it seems to only happen on the second question. Heck, you can flub the first question and ace the second and they'll join you. Otherwise, them sweating just gets you an item. Either way, the battle ends and you only get experience if you didn't kill anyone else. There are points where if an enemy is weaker than you and you get their health down, you can talk them into giving you power without the questionnaire. Just be mindful that you only have so much room for these personas, but they expand over time. At any rate, we hear the knights talking about the princess, aka on, so we need to rescue her. She's about to be executed by Shadow Kamashita, and she starts to see what this guy is truly like. He even blames her for Shiho jumping off, because she refused to have sex with him. On spirits begin to wane, but you tell her to fight on. It's like I always say, slaves should just behave and... Shut up. I've had enough of this. You piss me off, you son of a bitch! My... It's taken far too long. Tell me, who is going to avenge him if you don't? Forgiving him was never the option. Such is the scream of the other you that dwells with me. I am thou, thou art I. We can finally forge a contract. I hear you, Carmen. You're right. No more holding back! There you go. Nothing can be solved by restraining yourself. Understand? Then I'll gladly lend you my strength. How 
is it your friends have cooler awakenings than you? She even gets a badass moment where she cuts down her cognition self and makes one hell of a speech. You stole everything from Shiko. You destroyed her. Now it's your turn. I will rob you of everything! How dare you! Enough of your insolence! No, I've had enough of you! No one's gonna stop me now! Let's go, Carmen! Anyway, now that she has Carmen, she can use a variety of fire spells and, and have some healing magic to boot. She uses whips to attack directly, and for her ranged weapon, she has... A machine gun. Oh. After that, we're forced to leave again, and we tell her what we know, and she's more than happy to help us out. Because she really wants revenge on Kamashita for what he did to Shiho. So now we have a full group, including our partial navigator character, Morgana. We decide to part for now, and figure out when to strike Kamashita's palace. Since we need to prep ourselves first. Before that, though, we have to convince Sojiro to let us keep Morgana, since he can't contact us from the other world. But keep it quiet when we're open for business. And don't let it roam downstairs, or I'll toss it out. Oh, and I'm not going to take care of it. That's all on you. <sighs> Seriously. I had to keep calling out in that cute little voice. This is why I tend to like the Jameson Price characters. Gruff, but often kind. Anyway, about them preparations. The first place we go to is a clinic run by this goth lady named Tai Takami, that was in the cafe earlier, who was said to have strange medicines that we could use and something we might try talking to her about later. She is one of our future confidants after all, and I'll quickly go through each of them later. On the next day, we meet up with the weapon dealer of this game, Munahisa Iwai, who looks like Junpei if he matured and ditched his perverted voice, who will sell you weapons and armor. Like Takami, he has a cool looking menu interface. Soon, Morgana decides to teach us about crafting. Using materials found in the metaverse, we can make lockpicks and other items. Um, uh, what are you doing? I know you're in the body of a cat, but if you're supposed to be human, maybe try not acting like a cat. Doing this can give you two points in proficiency. Three if you're lucky, so you can save scum here if you want. Either way, today's the day you're given the freedom to choose how you want to approach the story. You have until the end of the deadline to capture your target's heart, or else it's game over. There are multiple game over cutscenes, but I won't be showing any of them, since you can view them online easily. And like I said, you can use the online network by using the touchpad to see what everyone's been choosing for each day. There's many activities that you can do, and many more that open up over time, so let me give you some of the basics of what your free time can consist of. Among things, you can raise your social stats which can be done by reading books, studying at the library or the cafe, do a part-time job for money and stats, you can watch a movie, play video games, you can work out at the gym to increase your health and skill points, many things that can be done most of the time but can be affected by the weather and the time of day. But the most important thing of all is interacting with your confidants. For like social links, these are necessary to gain access to various perks they have to offer, but more importantly, they're needed to increase the amount of experience a newly fused persona gets. One thing before that though, is that confidant events are done in the traditional way. You get points toward a person if you say the right things during the event, and if you have enough, you'll hear an audio cue that lets you know that you're ready to do the next event. Otherwise, the current one you're in gives you a rank up. You spend time doing this, so it becomes part of the whole micromanaging your time and figuring out what works best for you. You get more points by having the corresponding persona of their arcana, and the best way to get them is through the Velvet Room. The way this works is like the earlier games. Take two persona and see what they might form into and at what level. And in this game, if they have open slots, you can select any of their skills to pass on. Depending on the rank of their arcana, you get bonus experience to get them higher leveled quicker. 
Of course, the persona you get is based on the level and arcana the fusion materials have, and you cannot get anything higher than your current level. You can register personas that are different from what's in the compendium, and you can summon them out with money, so long as you have room. Other features include being able to strengthen a persona by sacrificing them to power up another, even getting one of their skills at random, putting them in lockdown to have them learn skills to cover for their weaknesses, special fusions that take more than two personas, and the public execution, aka network fusion, that takes another person's persona and fuses it with one of your own. That can only be done once a day, but you can get high level personas even if you're under leveled. And with that, it is time to cover Kamashita's palace. Unlike 3 and 4, where the dungeons are randomly generated, this game does what Tokyo Mirage Sessions did and have dungeons with a more static design. They have an actual layout, the fitting to the theme of the palace you're in, and it allows for the game designers to come up with unique traps and puzzles. There's also plenty of cover points to get you moving across and ambush enemies quicker, and there are points where backtracking can occur to find a new way forward. It's a must when trying to find your way, and one thing that helps you immensely is your third eye ability. Granted by Igor through his confidant perks, this lets you see places you can jump to and what hidden items can be found in breakable objects. These treasures can even be sold to a Y, who doesn't question where you get them. None of these shopkeepers ever do. Part of the fun in this game is how you traverse, though it kinda gets stale after a few dungeons, which is why I'm hoping the Royal fixes the dungeon exploration so it feels like a complete upgrade from TMS. We should be gliding around long distances with grappling hooks and stuff. So those trailers better not be lying to me! Also, by this point, you should have one of the more important party skills from your friends, called Baton Pass. This lets you pass a character's turn to Ren or anyone with the skill, even increasing your attack and healing capabilities. Other abilities your party can get include snapping people out of afflictions, help with negotiations, follow-up attacks that can knock down one or more enemies depending on who uses it, and even protect you from fatal damage if possible. You could say getting your party member's confidants up is a priority, especially when getting to rank 10, for you get more than just another top fusion persona to work for. Anyway, they keep piling on more on how big Kamashita's ego is and the sort of creep stuff he's into. And the longer you go on, the less likely you are to finish because it's getting hard to keep up with health and SP. The first dungeon does feel like it goes on for a long time, and it's expected for you to make repeat trips, as until you get further into the game, you don't have access to many good recovery items. But it is doable, and I of course did it on the first try. I managed to pass the mini-bosses that laid in my wake, I dealt with heavily distorted rooms that screw with your vision a bit, and all manner of traps. But eventually, I find my way to the treasure room. The real treasure isn't the stuff on the floor, it's the orb floating in the air. Morgana says that we have to make it manifest, and since we worked on securing an infiltration route, we have the means to get in and out. All that's left is to send a calling card to Kamashita, alerting him that we're going to steal his desires and forcibly make the treasure appear. We only get one shot at this, or else it disappears forever. Of course, choosing the day you want to send the card takes up your whole day, but you can still craft. Either way, for most of the time you have to plan ahead and pick the two days you want to use when going after the treasure, since you can still game over if you try going on a day that goes past the deadline. Anything that normally happens that day will still happen before the scheduled plot, and right now, Kamashita sees the calling cards plastered everywhere, and he isn't happy. Must be some kind of prank. Was it you two? So you're playing dumb? <laughs> it's not a problem. You'll be expelled soon enough anyway. Come, steal it if you can. Oh, don't you worry, you'll get yours soon enough. So security will be maxed out, meaning you might be kicked out if you mess up in a regular fight, 
though I never had the guts to find out. Though some areas will lose enemies, so you could go back for missing items. Otherwise, you just quick travel to the safe room closest to the treasure, and well, there it is! It's a giant crown! We just gotta carry that out, Dan. Damn it, Morgana! Now's not the time to be a cat! Also, Morgana's Arcana ranks up automatically as the story goes on. He's one of a few who are like that. Anyway, here's a common thing to occur. Us meeting the boss anyway, because while we might be stealing undercover in real life, we still suck at stealing under the noses of the bosses. So Shadow Kamashita starts yapping about how people kept his bad behavior a secret because they wanted to bask in his success and stuff. They willingly protect me so that we all may profit from it. Profit? There are too many imbeciles who don't understand that. Including naive brats like you and that girl who tried to kill herself. True, she's a total idiot. Letting you manipulate her, trying to commit suicide. And I'm even more of a dumbass for not realizing that. No matter what kind of fool someone might be, they don't need your permission to live their lives! I'm a cut above all other humans. Above? You mean beneath? You're a goddamn demon obsessed with your sick desires! <laughs> That's right. I'm not like you. I am a demon who rules this world! And like in Persona 4, Shadow Selves can typically become monsters, and oh boy, is he one pervy bastard. So for this fight, we have to heal through heavy volleyball damage, and also destroy his cup of... women legs that heal him. He also slurps cognition on for a bit for attack power, so you should defend yourself if you really need to. And then there's the special action that you can perform during combat. By letting one of your party members step out for a moment, they can do something to hopefully tip the scales against the boss and do loads of damage. For this fight, you need to have someone knock the crown off his head, since he values that above all else. All so long as you keep damaging him and not let him see your helper. Play your cards right, and he will go down in no time. Now, it's time to watch him squirm. Scared? Right now? You're seeing the same view that Shiho did. I'm sure she was scared too. Except she had no choice but to jump. What will you do? Will you jump? Or would you rather die here? Do you want to finish him off? It's your call. No, please wait. I beg you. Just forgive me. Shut up. I bet everyone told you the same. But you, you took everything from them! No! I, I accept defeat. You want this? Take it. Go ahead and finish me off. You do that, and my real self will go down too. You have that right, since you've won. <laughs> On! If his mind shuts down, he can't admit his crimes. You're kind, Lady On. With that, Shadow Kamashita accepts his defeat and disappears. But since we took the treasure, that means the palace begins to collapse. And once it does, that's it. It's gone forever. The treasure is now in the form of an Olympic medal that he won long ago. That he treasured more than anything else like his glory. And although it's not THE same medal he actually has, it's close enough to the real thing that you can sell it later. Otherwise, we can only wait until the deadline to see if the change of heart occurs. There are some hints, like Kamashita not showing up at school and acting strange, but the only way of knowing is to wait. And on that day, then an assembly occurs, we finally see what the real Kamashita is like after getting his heart changed. I have repeatedly done things that were unbecoming of a teacher verbally abusing students, 
physically abusing my team and <sighs> sexually harassing female students. I am the reason why Shiho Suzui tried to kill herself. I thought of the school as my own castle. There were even students that I sentenced to expulsion simply because I didn't like them. I will, of course, rescind those. I am truly sorry for putting innocent youths through such horrible acts. I am an arrogant, shallow, and shameful person. No, I'm worse than that. I will take responsibility. I kill myself for it. What? Did he just say that? Like kill him? Mr. Kamashita, please died. get off the stage for now. Don't run, you bastard! Shiho's still alive, even after all the things that made her want to die. You have no right to run from this! Agreed. If you're going to atone, you have to commit to it, and without expecting forgiveness, no matter how long it takes. And that's that. Now the students are talking about how this phantom thief prank was real after all. Maybe they do believe in it. Those who doubted us apologize for what they did and wish to make it up to you. Mishima included, of course. With that, just a matter of figuring out what to do now. We need to celebrate, but will we continue our ways as phantom thieves? What sort of people will we meet and who could join us along the way? Find out in part two. some slumdog brat with so much prize money. It's just not possible. You must have cheated. No, it wasn't cheating. It was destiny. 